So, said all of this, I pass to introduce uh, uh, Muhammad Abdul Magid. He's a co-director of the Inter-Paris Trust Artificial Intelligence Project. Projects. He's a uh, He's a, a professor at the Linguistics and School of Information and uh, from the University of British Columbia. So um, he works uh, in natural language processing and machine learning. And uh, he will introduce us uh, to the Interpares Trust Artificial Intelligence. In fact, several of uh, the attendees, uh, the, the participants in this seminar, are researchers and collaborators in this project, so we will uh, we will have to, to to thank also the direction of the project that allowed and facilitated in some cases that people visit us here in Girona. I hope also you will have time to visit the city. This is a nice city, so the floor is yours. That's crucial. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Luis. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hola. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Mohammed Abdul Majid. Uh, I'm a Canada Research Chair at the University of British Columbia. I work at the intersection of natural language processing and machine learning. I'm also a visiting associate professor at Mohammed bin Zayed University of AI in Abu Dhabi, UAE. Uh, so I am talking to you today on behalf of myself, uh, but also my colleague, uh, Professor Luciana Durante from the high school in the University of British Columbia, who is a principal investigator and the co-director of iTrust AI. I have a lot of slides, but I only have 15 minutes. And so what I'm going to try to do today is to walk you through some of the things that we uh, have been thinking about in the context of iTrust AI. Uh, but then, you know, offline, I'm happy to talk to people and answer questions and engage and so on. We are very lucky to be here. I would like to thank Luis and uh, my colleague Pilar and all other uh, colleagues who are here, like helping us uh, kind of uh, move from point A to point B, but also see the place and also discuss and engage and discuss, you know, uh, different uh, aspects of our work. I also would like to uh, thank our hosts at uh, faber um, who are hosting uh, you know, us in the residency there. It's, a, it's an amazing place, and I think it's kind of inspiring a lot of uh, thoughtful discussions. <clears throat> okay, uh, let me tell you about iTrust AI very quickly. This is the fifth uh, phase of uh, InterParis uh, project. Uh, it's co-directed by my colleague uh, Luciana Duranti, as I said, and myself. It's funded by one of uh, Canada's uh, uh, funding agencies, uh, one of the major ones, uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of uh, Canada, uh, dubbed as SHRC, uh, it's an interesting abbreviation. Uh, so this one, uh, this phase, uh, focuses on maintain maintaining the trustworthiness of digital records over time. So lots of details that I will not get into. As I said, I have a lot of slides, but this is a high level. We want to know how do we engage with records and archives with AI. AI being uh, very important, as I hope you would agree, and uh, you know, records management and archives being crucial to uh, the functioning of society, any society, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, what is trustworthiness? We can think about trustworthiness across different angles here. So, you know, reliability, accuracy, and authenticity are, uh, you know, ones uh, that come to mind and uh, we can, you know, conceptualize of it, each of them and, and so on. Um, I will not discuss it further, but trustworthiness is important. That's the point that we would like to make. And how do we actually maintain it, uh, including uh, with working with AI, right? <coughs> and we want to assess uh, authenticity uh, and we want to do this uh, including with AI. So th the big question that we have, could we use artificial intelligence to ensure and verify the authenticity through time, right? Um, so that, that is the big question that we uh, ponder upon. And you know, AI systems are computing systems that use algorithms that can carry out complex tasks, as you know, and, and so on, right? And um, th they are capable, they process large quantities of information, they calculate and predict, they learn and adapt, they recognize and classify. But then can we use these AI systems for carrying out competent, uh, competently and efficiently all records and archives functions 
all the while respecting the nature and ensuring and continuing trustworthiness of the records. That's the principal question that we ask as a starting point in the context of I trust AI. Okay, um, so there are some downsides of AI systems. They are oftentimes inconclusive, uh, inscrutable, uh, misguided. They can be, they can be unfair, they can uh, be transformative and non-traceable. These are some downsides and you can think about each of these and we want to uh, you know, ensure that we avoid uh, falling prey to some of these downsides. Um, you know, the decisions they made are, you know, can be based on uh, past decisions and so on, and the future is not always similar to the past, so that's kind of like something that we know, right? Um, and you know, people have been thinking about um, what we should keep in mind while working with AI. There are uh, several uh, principles that people have came up with, including these ones that came from a Montreal, a group of people who sat together and kind of agreed on respecting well-being, autonomy, privacy, solidarity, democratic participation, equity, diversity, and inclusion, caution, responsibility, sustainable development. You know, these are not exhaustive, but they are ones that are important that people have agreed on. Okay? <clears throat> and we keep some of these on mind. Uh, uh, you know, AI is, is a big thing. There are lots of things that you can refer to as AI. Uh, you know, I mean, these are some examples that I will not actually talk about now. Uh, maybe some of them will come uh, uh, later. Uh, but, you know, AI is a huge field, and it's, 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 it's a field that has been developing over time for a very long time, right? Um, and the archival problem that uh, um, we are thinking about we come from uh, th this point that says, okay, um, people have been using off-the-shelf tools, meaning like tools that other people have developed to work with archives. And, you know, these off-the-shelf tools were not designed with the archival problem in mind necessarily. So they are not actually best suited to deal with uh, the, the problem of archives. So in iTrust AI, we, uh, we said, okay, actually we are going to develop these systems ourselves uh, with a lot of guidance from professionals and experts who know about records and the archives. So in this, uh, in this partnership, we develop the systems because we know the technology, we know the methods, and we also know uh, w what we need to do as, as professionals you know, in the field of records and the archives. And so we're kind of like seeking to shift this relationship between, you know, as an archivist, I just use a tool to do something, and this tool may not have been designed for me. It's just designed for something else. I'm trying to adapt it. Now we're saying, no, okay, if you, if you are an expert in, in records and archives, tell me what you want, and then I'll think about it, and then we'll sit on a table over coffee, and then we'll discuss, and then I will design a tool that works for you. That's the big thing that you know, uh, th th that we are guided by, okay? Um, so, so yeah, so trustworthiness is, is, is the biggest goal that we have in the context of this project. We have several objectives. We, we seek to identify specific AI technologies that can address critical records and archives challenges. We determine the benefits and risks of these technologies. We ensure that archival concepts and principles inform the development of responsible, and the responsible is a very important point here, AI and we validate outcomes. So we work with like experts to say, okay, does this tool actually work? Does it do what you wanted it to do? How do we evaluate it? Is, is, it, is it working for you? And, and so on. Okay, and we have so many studies. I think we reached like over 50 studies in, in this partnership right now and growing by the day. We have a lot of collaborators um, you know, from so many different countries and we expect so much uh, out of this project we already have deliverables that, that are existing today. So for example, machine translation systems, image, image recognition and description, OCR systems that kind of take an image and turn it into machine readable text, handwriting recognition, summarization system, text classification systems, style transfer uh, for, for language civilization, and, and so on. So these are some of the expected outcomes, but also uh, one very important outcome is training and educational uh, outcomes. You know, we seek to train so many students, so many professionals, um, and postdocs, and, and so on, um, in the context of this partnership. This is why we have a lot of workshops and give talks, such as this one, for example, and, and so on. So lots of students, lots of professionals are in, uh, in collaboration with us, and, and I think we have been doing amazing 
job, at least you guys have, like the, the, the people who collaborate with us. Uh, so we co-create knowledge, we design new courses, and, and kind of synthesize AI developers to the needs of uh, records and archives. We have participants from 30 countries in five continents, 83 uh, universities, 22 organizations, six regional, state, and national archives, including from here in Spain, more than 110 uh, academics, more than 100 uh, professionals, uh, more than 40 students. So this is a mega project that we're very proud of. Um, okay, so, so here's like the slides I have just went through quickly. Uh, th these are prepared by my colleague Luciana. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I, I kind of wanted to spend uh, enough time on them, uh, although I know I'm going very fast. But let me show you very quickly some more slides. How many more minutes do I have? 10, uh, ten, min ten minutes. Uh, five plus five. Yeah, yeah. I pr uh, I, I promised Luis double ice cream, so he's giving, yeah, okay, so, <laughs> so, so, so to, to summarize, the archival problem that we're thinking about is to develop these AI systems for records and archives competently and efficiently while maintaining the nature and trustworthiness of the records. I already said this, I'm saying it in a different way, okay, but that's the big thing that we're thinking about, and like, for, you know, when I sat on the table and started discussing this, I kind of like, as a co-director of this project, I kind of sit like with colleagues such as Hervo and Peter and you know the rest of us, you know, uh, and they say, how do we do this? Well, I, I kind of like say, okay, so let's break down archival functions into AI tasks because that's what we have to do, and then good tasks are ones that we can clearly define for the computer because the computer actually needs to understand these at a very basic level, and then let's proceed from simple to complex. You know, we start like simple things, design uh, a system, and then go to a more complex system. And we are actually going to develop the AI methods. It's not like we're just like, uh, somebody created something, we'll just use it. No, because we also work in the field of AI and we develop new methods and, and, and so on, right? And new methods that are inspired by the task that we are given here. And, you know, we, we seek to design state of the art SOTA uh, models. Uh, that are explainable, interpretable, and so on. We are also, you know, using some models that other people have uh, have uh, created, if they are good, you know. Then, uh, then, then we need a lot of data uh, in order to create these systems. We identify, acquire, and develop these data sets. Uh, we uh, have a lot of questions in mind, ethical questions, uh, questions related to privacy, ownership, respect, community norms. You know, if you go to a certain community that have data, let's think about people uh, wh whose languages are endangered, for example, you have to respect these people while you actually work on, uh, work with them, you know, develop these things for them, you know, uh, and, and, and also once we design something, how do we declare success? How do we know that we have done something that's valuable? You know, how do we evaluate in other words, you know? So that's also another question that we have in mind. Uh, as I said, we have a major human resources and dissemination component as part of the project. We create a lot of tools, we share them online uh, we, we, like for free, we want people to use our uh, tutorials, we put a lot of code online, we have recorded a lot of videos, a lot of Python code, notebooks and so on. Uh, we also kind of like integrate a lot of these in our courses when we teach in universities and so on. So that, that the training component is a huge one. Uh, let me take a step back, what is AI? I think I don't need to uh, define it, but it's that big circle, and within AI there's machine learning that kind of learns from data, and then within machine learning there is uh, deep learning, which is artificial neural networks that are everywhere now and that are, are driving the current revolution uh, that, that you see uh, is happening around us. I have a lot of uh, low-level explanation of how things work machine learning-wise. I will not go through it, but you know, I can say, okay, I can take this sentence and let's assume that I want to know if this sentence is positive or negative. For example, if this is a movie review or a review of uh, a restaurant, right? And you want to know if this restaurant is good or bad, so you do something called sentiment analysis. And how do you do sentiment analysis? You know, you can go to the different steps that we go through in order to do this. I'm not going to go over these slides, but it's the, the point here is that it's very simple, but it's also tricky because language is very ambiguous. Once I say the movie is not exciting, then I, cut, I, I shifted from, um, you know, saying the movie is very exciting, which was positive. If I do negation, 
then now it's not positive anymore. So it's actually complex. We cannot just design some rule-based system to do it. We have to design machine learning systems. We take the data, we put it into multidimensional space, we call it vectors and so on, and then we work with it. And we pass it to a neural network and we kind of try to do things. I will abstract over these, but there are artificial neural networks in that context, and we can actually uh, do this inspired by what happens in the human brain. What you see on the top left-hand side is the human cortex. We, when we see something, it passes through different regions in the brain, and we get to recognize that this is actually a human face. And it goes through stages, so we can actually design the neural networks as layers, and there can be so many very layers, and, uh, and this is why we say it's deep. This is why we say it's a deep deep uh, uh, neural network, right? And there can be different types of these deep neural networks. You know, what you see on the top right-hand side is what is known as a uh, bi-directional recurrent neural network. You don't need to worry about what that is, but we can kind of put them together as Legos and we work with them, so that's what you see on the bottom. Uh, or uh, on the bottom left, which is another type of neural network that's a convolutional neural network. And there are uh, more recent ones. That, so, for example, the transformer, a giant model that is actually empowering everything that you see. If you have used your email today, there is, <coughs> there is a transformer in the background uh, keeping spam away and so on. If you've used uh, you know, a machine translation system on Google or whatever, that's what is used in production. That is also what is behind self-driving cars and everything else. Okay, that transformer model came from Google 2016, 2017. Um, and then I have some slides about how do we do machine learning, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. I won't go over them, but the idea is that if you have some humans who look at some data, give you some labels, you can use these labels to design these systems, and they, they will be called supervised systems. But you, if you don't have labels, then you have to do unsupervised, which is just basically clustering the data a little bit. Uh, or you can do something in between, which is called semi-supervised learning. You know, you want to know if this book was written by Shakespeare or Dante, then you give some data to humans, and then you take the labels from the humans and train a system system and get to your business. Uh, this is not the only thing you can do. There's also what is known as self-supervised learning. You know, you can say, take some data and work with it in very intelligent ways uh, uh, to, to get to do things. I, I won't go through it, but it just cuts across text, image, and speech. Same self-supervised learning methods apply everywhere, and this is why we have all these multimodal systems that are very, very successful. I mean, if you use your phone, if you've used Siri or whatever other virtual assistant today, I mean, these methods are in the background. A um, couple more minutes very quickly, if uh, Luis is okay. So just want to say something about three more minutes. Yes, I'm, I'm good. I'm on time. Uh, so there, there are these uh, diffusion models which are very, very interesting. You take an image and then you kind of like noise this image. You remove some pixels and so on. So you go from right to left. And then until you reach on the very far left here, a totally noised image. We don't see a human face anymore. But then you can go back and try to reconstruct the image to get to the human face again. And this is called a diffusion model. And that's a wonderful model because it is a model that's actually empowering a lot of t uh, image generation that you actually see. I'll show you a slide. In two slides, there will be something uh, fancy. Uh, and, and, you know, if you are thinking about chat GPT and so on, it's a very simple system that tries to predict one token at a time. So if I give it a, a word like it, then it will predict what next word comes. So is, and, you know, is sunny and sunny in and in Abu Dhabi or Cairo or like whatever place. Uh, I think Girona would be a good example. Um, and, and these systems are called autoregressive models. There are a lot of math and like whatever behind them. But then you can take them and you can put on top of them what is called as reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is just another learning paradigm where you put an agent in real world and then you ask this agent to do things and may, maybe pour some water. And if it does a mistake, then you tell it like that, that's bad. Don't do this again. And if it does it well, you give it some reward. Okay? And this is called reinforcement learning and you can put this on top of this autoregressive model that predicts one token at a time, and it actually gets it to uh, act, to, to, to follow human instruction. That's what ChatGPT does, right? So write an email to my supervisor saying that I will be off today, you know? So it would write an email, or write an email to Luis saying, give me one more minute, then it will do that. It will follow, follow instructions, right? So, uh, so that, that is actually the, the type of uh, machine learning that is used there, and that is what is empowering ChatGPT, the fancy thing that we see. 
Uh, and then there's natural language processing as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a field where a lot of things happen. Uh, so it can be understanding such as tell me if this is positive or negative or it can be like generation, you know, translate this sentence into something else. And we can do a lot of things uh, with it. Uh, this is uh, something that maybe you will uh, find relevant. Uh, thank you. Um, such as, uh, you know, give it some document and extract the names of people, places, organizations from it. And that, I think this is very relevant to the field of archives, for example. And, you know, we create a lot of tutorials uh, online. So I, I'm happy to pass the link to all of these tutorials a lot of code, a lot of videos, and so on that uh, you know, uh, can, can be used for uh, uh, developing these things. Uh, we can extract topics from lots of documents. We can classify texts or actually even declassify them, uh, remove certain sensitive information. And we have created tutorials about these. Machine translation is another thing. Uh, you know, multilinguality, working with too many languages. Optical character recognition and, uh, uh, you know, uh, handwriting recognition is another v uh, important problem. And we also have created uh, tutorials for these. Speech technologies, and Peter is here, he's working on a speech. Um, and, you know, there's this tool called Whisper that came uh, very recently from OpenAI. But then there are also lots of vision technologies. Uh, you know, take an image, tell me what's in this image, or write a caption for this image, and so on. There are lots of models that are being created by the day. Uh, you can use it for museums. And there is also generative AI that, that's empowered by diffusion models that I talked about, right? So you can tell the model, I want to generate an image of a bunch of people sitting in an interesting place listening to a talk, and then it will create this image, like that, wh what I'm seeing right now. Or, you know, it can generate art and, and so on, as you can see. This is all AI generated. It's beautiful. It's amazing that we can generate these with machines. Uh, and, and I think I, I, I will just stop here. Um, uh, the, the thing that I want to actually finish with is that there is a lot that is going on and it can be really, really, really overwhelming. Uh, but, you know, as humans who care, I think we need to slow down and think about the technology carefully, how we actually use it, how we not use it, because sometimes we should not use it. And I believe that my message to you today and people online is that you will need to do a lot of training in order to understand the technology and how to engage with the technology. And training can be like attending talks like this one. For example, in I Trust AI, we take it as our responsibility to offer a lot of this training, and we welcome collaborations from all around the world. And I really wanted to commend all the colleagues who are here, who are partners with I Trust AI, who contribute to the success of it. And thank you very much again for hosting us. And that's the end of my uh, talk. Thank you, Louise, very much for being patient with me. Typically so. <laughs>